But we're going to talk this morning about fasting, and uh, um, some of this is very serious. Some may be a little bit humorous as well, but I'm, I'm speaking from my heart. I really mean what we're going to be looking at and talking about uh, this morning, and I don't want uh, no one, no one should get under condemnation this morning. That's not the intent of this. God doesn't act that way. No one should feel guilty like, oh, this is, you know, what about me? I've done something wrong or whatever. This is not God as well. But we're going to look at what the Bible says about, um, about fasting and prayer. And then we want to get the right attitude. And then we want to go forward and step into this time. I'll be really honest with you. Uh, the beginning of this past week, as, as we were, some of us especially, were preparing and getting ready for this time of fasting, prayer, fasting and prayer, as I was thinking about it, young people, I don't know what you dread. I don't, I don't know what are some things you dread. Exam time at school, maybe? Or maybe you love exam time at school. Or I, I used to love exam time at school because um, I was a show off. <laughs> the Lord's dealt with that. But I'll be really honest with you. At the beginning of this week, when I was thinking about fasting and prayer coming up, my heart was so reluctant, really reluctant. My heart was so resistant. And I just thought about it. I just thought, oh. And I'm just being really honest with you because I don't care how long I've been a pastor. I'm a person. I'm a person in a body. And the body never, our bodies never want to fast. Our stomachs always want to be king. They never want to be a servant. Our stomach never wants to be a servant. It always wants to be fed and served, right? But I'm so encouraged because um, as I've been preparing through the week and as I was preparing some of the materials and preparing to preach, and I've asked the Lord, the Lord has been changing my reluctant, resistant heart. And God does that when we ask him to. That's the great thing about God. He can take our hearts that are stony and hard. He can make them soft hearts of flesh that he can do something with. Um, and he helps us. He, he helps us to follow him and to walk in his ways. And he wants to do that this morning as well. So let's look at some things about fasting. And let's look at some things. Let's start with the Old Testament because that's where it starts. We're going to look at it. Four examples. This will also be in your handout. Some of this will be in your handout a little bit later um, for fasting and prayer. And there's much, much more than what we can look at this morning. So we're going to go really quickly this morning because I do want to get all the way through and to get to some practical things. And I want us to look at the first one. And I will spend a little more time with this one. Um, from 2 Chronicles 20. And if you're not familiar with this story from the history of Judah, this was after Israel had broken, the, the 12 tribes had split into uh, the 10 tribes and the 2 tribes. And this was at that time. Jehoshaphat was a godly king. And in 2 Chronicles 20, he hears, the report comes to him, and I don't know, have you ever gotten a really bad report before from a doctor or from a bank or from a company, or from your family, something bad has come. Jehoshaphat had just such a report. And I'm encouraged because I see us in some of these things. He received the report that a huge army from Edom was coming. And the army was greater. They were now a very small kingdom. The army was greater than they were, much, much greater than they were. They were, they were better equipped. They were more numerous. They were Oh, they were huge, and they were coming their way. And there was nothing in himself and in the kingdom that Jehoshaphat said that could deliver them from this situation. And so what did he do? He called out to the Lord, and then he called three days of fasting and prayer. He called three days of fasting and prayer, and he said, fast and pray because this is happening. And then they all came. And I want to encourage you. Here's an answer to one of our first questions or thoughts this morning. Can, can families and young people be included in times of fasting and prayer? And if you will read 2 Chronicles 20, you will find out that in 2 Chronicles 20, um, that it is in, uh, in verse 4, so people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Uh, he asked them to begin fasting. And then in verse 5, Jehoshaphat stood before the community in front of the new courtyard of the temple, and he prayed. So he begins to pray. And if you'll read this, you will see uh, in verse 13, the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children. So everybody, so the young people as well, had a part in this because, because if this army came, everybody was going to be affected. The young people were going to be affected. If this army came, and, and I want to 
challenge you this morning, each one of us this morning, and, sp and especially the youth, but this is for all of us as well. Um, we sometimes think that we are, especially for young, um, or especially if we're this way or that way, that we are immune from attacks of the enemy. We are immune from terrible troubles or things like that. And I want to say something to you this morning in case you didn't know it. You will find it out soon. Satan never fights fair. You think he's going to wait till you grow up and grow up in the Lord and become strong in the Lord and say, well, I can stand now. Satan will get you when he can. He never fights fair. And some of us, sometimes we go through hard times and difficult times. We think, Phew, some relief, and I get a break, and wham, something else comes. The enemy never fights fair. He never fights fair. He'll kick you when you're down. He'll try to kick you. Let me put it that way. He'll try to kick you when you're down. Now, we're going to talk about God instead of the enemy this morning. But what I want us to see is this, that we all have a place in waiting on the Lord and in coming before him and fasting. And we're going to talk about how we can fast, especially if we have limitations. And for young people, there are certain ways you can and you, you should and you shouldn't fast as a young person because your body is growing. But what I want to say is this, the benefits, the benefits of fasting and prayer are available to every one of us, whatever our age, however young we are in the Lord, however old we are in the Lord. And so here's this picture that we see of they all stand before the Lord, not just the men, the fighting men, and that's a picture for us this morning. It's not just those that, oh, elder, those that are old in the Lord, the pastors, the leaders, those are the ones who really dig in with the fasting and prayer. There's a place for every one of us. They're all standing before the Lord. They pray, and there in, that, in this passage, and there's much more there, is one of my favorite, favorite verses in the whole Bible. It has become one of the prayers of my heart. And if you've been around me for a while, you have heard me pray it at Lighthouse. Jehoshaphat closes his prayer by praying this. And now, O Lord, we do not know what to do, but what? Our eyes are on you. That's how he closes his prayer. Other translations say, but Lord, we're looking to you. That has become one of the prayers of my heart because so often we don't know what to do, but when, we're, when our eyes are on him. Now, here's another part. So, so I, want to just, I just want to go ahead and say to you this morning, if you are facing a situation or if there are circumstances in your life that are like this, there's a vast army against you. It is so much bigger than you. You are overwhelmed. You can't do something about it. You can't change the circumstances. You can't change the situation. Hey, this one is for you. This is for you. And so they call out to the Lord. And here's this verse in here that I love. As they're standing there, this is in verse 14. The spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. And he said, listen. Listen, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged. And then God gives his answer. And brothers and sisters, what I want to say to you this morning, and young people as well, is this. When we come to the Lord in desperation, oh God, just as Jehoshaphat said, oh God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you in, in humbling himself, in humility. And that's when God really hears, and that's when God really answers, and that's what, humbling do, uh, that's what fasting does. Fasting really humbles us. It's really hard for me to be proud when I am so hungry and I am so weak. And, and that's all right with God, and that's a good place to be. And we, that, that proud, haughty part of us gets humbled. And he says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And some of you are at that place, and you need to get in and dig in like Jehoshaphat did. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are, are on you. And it takes more than a five-minute prayer. It's going to take some digging in. But here's the great thing, as I just read to you. When you do, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come, and he is going to bring God's answer to you, for you, in your life, in your family, in your situation. I am so encouraged by Second Chronicles 20. I really am. And I challenge you this week, dig in that and get more from there. There's so much there that will help you. So that's one of the first ones we see, and we could keep on going, but we can't. we got to keep 
we, we could keep on with this, but we're going to keep on going. Um, what's another time in the Old Testament? We're going to look at New Testament and at Jesus as well. We look at Ezra, and this is when he and the exiles were in Babylon, and the king let them go, and he said, you can go back to Jerusalem, you can take things back to the temple, and here is here are ton, here's tons of gold for you to take back. Here are the vessels of the temple. So here's Ezra. He has all of these wonderful things, but Babylon is here and Jerusalem is here. And in between Babylon and Jer Jerusalem is a treacherous sp space. It's a treacherous road with bandits, with, with vagabonds, with dangers on the road, dangers from the, 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 the uh, road itself and from people and all sorts of things, along with all of their small children that they're going to take. Families are going back. And here they are in Babylon, and they've got to get to Jerusalem with all of these, with their families, which are the most precious, and all of the, 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 the uh, gold and the silver and the brass, which was almost as valuable as the gold. They've got to get it all the way back to Jerusalem. How are they going to do that? Here's the great thing. Ezra looks and he puts himself and God on the spot. And sometimes that's a good thing to do. Because you know what? He has just told the king, Oh, king, our God is a great God. And he will protect us and he will take care of us. Now they've got to get from Babylon to Jerusalem. No soldiers. They're not warriors. No, no implements. No, no, uh, no, no. They wouldn't have had guns then. I started to say guns, but no guns, um, spears, arrows, whatever they would have used, no chariots, no horses to protect them from all of the dangers in between. And Ezra has put himself and God on the spot because he says, I've, I've told the king. And so he says, I was ashamed to ask the king for help. And so you know what he does? He begins to fast and pray, and he tells everybody, fast and pray as well. And this is a great place to be. When you and I face choices in this world as you will face this year. As some of you are facing right now, young people as some of you are facing, we sometimes think I have all of these choices ahead of me. Which one will I choose? I've got five or six choices. We don't have five or six choices according to God's word. We have two choices. We have two choices. And when we're choosing, one way will be the way where I depend on myself I depend on what I can do. I depend on my arm. I depend on my wisdom. I depend on my family, on my strength, on all of these things, on my pocketbook, on my education, on my experience, all of these things. I'm going to depend on this or I'm going to depend on God. Those are your only two choices, brothers and sisters. That's it. There's nothing in between. You're going to depend on God or you're going to depend on the, the world and the flesh. That really is, those are your only two choices. And Ezra realizes we can't depend on ourselves. We're going to have to depend on God. And he does that by fasting and praying. And the people do that by fasting and praying. And sure enough, God gets them safely from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem. So if you this morning are facing some choices and you think, am I going to do this or am I going to do this? This is a great time for you to choose. I'm not going to depend on the arm of flesh, the strength. I'm going to depend on God. Fasting humbles us and gets us to that place. The other one is David. Here's another one. And I, we've included this one because this one is very different from the other ones. Do you know in this one, this happens after David had committed the terrible sin. He had committed adultery, then he murdered, and then he lied about it and covered it up and deceived. And then, went, and then so hypocrisy was in there as well. Terrible time of David's life. And because of that, his child got sick and David fasts and prays for his child. The child dies. The child dies. And some of you are looking at me like, the child dies? Yep. You'll read it yourself when, you get to the, when we get to the, uh, uh, into the handout that we're going to give you at the end. But you'll notice something about what David does. David has humbled himself before the Lord. You and I, so often, we pray and we ask God for certain things. And then... When God doesn't answer like we want him to, we get mad at God, don't we? We sure do. We get angry. We get bitter. We think this is not right. This is not fair. Why did this happen? God, you, this, 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 this. Learn from David. He fasted. He prayed. He was sincere about it. And after the child died, 
it says, as you will read in your devotions, David got up, he washed his face, he went to the temple, and he worshiped the Lord. And what I have found is this. I can sometimes come into times of fasting with a whole list of things that I want God to do. Do you have a whole list of things that you want God to do? Sure. Sure we do. I am learning. I haven't learned it all yet, but I am learning to come before God and give it to him and to let the time of fasting humble me before God. And then I find out sometimes God's not going to answer the way that I wanted him to. Or God's not going to do it in the time I wanted him to do it. But you know what? Because I've been humbled before him, it's okay. And I'm going to keep walking with God because he's a good God. And he's right. And he doesn't do things wrong. And he doesn't do things badly. He's a good God. And fasting and prayer helps me to get to that place. And it helps you to get to that place as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. Those are true words, brothers and sisters. Like them or not, the baby may die. But if you're humbled and humbled before the Lord, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. So here are some pictures. And then one more, Esther, that we know so very well. And I've included this one. We know this story so well. But I've also included this one because it, it covers some things that, um, that we wouldn't normally think about. Especially at that time, it was a man's world. It really was. If you did anything... You were a man. If you had any opportunities, you were a man. If you're going to do great things or be called or this or that, you are a man. And you know I'm not a woman's liver. You know that. You know that. But still many times there are things that you feel like, well, it's, it's closed to me. I can't do it. Or you may feel I'm too young for God to use me. I'm too young to be used by God in a great way. I want to say something to you this morning. Esther, because of her circumstances and her situations, Esther was probably, we don't know for sure, Esther was probably a teenager. A teenager. And through fasting and prayer, God used her to save a nation. To save a nation. Brothers and sisters, when we fast and pray and give ourselves to God, great things can happen. Great things can happen. And it's not just the pastors. Honestly, I'm looking forward to this time of fasting and prayer for God to do some special things in my life. But I'll tell you what would make me even happier. And Pastor Renee would say the same thing. What would make me even happier is to hear from all of you as you have waited on the Lord and as you have fasted and as you have prayed and to find out that God is going to be using you and doing great things in your life and doing great things through your life. That's when a church is healthy, not just when the pastors do stuff, not just when the pastors have a word or whatever. The Spirit of the Lord in Jehoshaphat fell on just on somebody who was standing in the congregation. And fasting and prayer brings us into the place where God can use us, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're male, female, rich, poor, fasting and prayer brings us in humility before God, and we're in God's hands, and then God does what we cannot do. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then we come to the New Testament, and um, so, so this answers our question. It's definitely in the Old Testament, but is it for us? Because that's Old Testament. Oh, yes. Let's look at the New Testament, and why don't we start with Jesus? And this is from the most famous sermon in the New Testament. If you're in the first service, please don't answer. Oh, this is for the young people. Young people, most famous sermon in the Bible. It's in the New Testament. Okay, Josh and David, they were, they've heard it already. Quiet, guys. Sermon on the... There we go. Sermon on the mountain. Colette answered, I think. <laughs> okay. She's still very youthful, too. Okay. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' is preaching begins in Matthew 5, and um, he starts to preach. He sees the crowd gather. He walks up the mountain. He sits down, and he starts teaching. He doesn't tell anybody, hey, come here. I'm going, to pr I'm going to teach to you now. Do you know what Jesus does? He just sits down, and he starts teaching. And those who are his disciples come to him. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Will you be drawn to his heart that he might teach you? Our time of fasting and prayer, we'll do that. We'll do that. It gives us the opportunity. 
And so let's look at what Jesus says. First come the Beatitudes, blessed are those, blessed are the poor in heart, blessed are the meek, blessed are that. And then he keeps on preaching. This is still part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's from Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We're going to look at just a little bit. Here we are, the teaching of Jesus. He begins talking about it. Let's put up the first part, first click. And Jesus says, when you give to someone, but when you give whatever, don't give this way, but give that way. Mm. Oh, he's talking about giving? Pastor Jennifer, let's not, talking about, let's not talk about giving. You know, giving, that's an Old Testament thing. I can kind of just do what I want to, what I feel. Jesus, in the middle of his sermon, talks about giving. What comes next? Ah, prayer. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, but when you pray, do it this way. Then pray like this, our Father in heaven. So the first thing is giving. Second thing is praying. What's the third thing? We know it's coming next. Yes, fasting. There we go. This is in verse 17 and 18. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, but when you fast. Now, we're reasonable people, so I want to ask you something. When Jesus preaches this way, and when, just look at the logic of it, does Jesus say if? No. What does he say? When. He says when. So what can we deduce, what can we say from what Jesus teaches? Jesus teaches and assumes and understands if we are his disciples, if you're someone who follows Jesus, if you follow Jesus, one of the parts of your Christian life is going to be giving. We can't talk much about that this morning because we're going to talk about fasting and prayer. It's going to be praying. It's going to be fasting. All of these are part of the normal Christian life. You say, no, Pastor Jennifer, that's the supernatural Christian life. That's the normal Christian life says Jesus. According to the words of Jesus, this is part of it. So for me, when I look at this as a Christian, as a Christian, not as a pastor, just as a Christian, I, I began fasting when I, I'm not boasting. It was, it was something that God, and I haven't, it hasn't been always regular in my life, but I remember the first time I fasted, I was a teenager. I was an older teen, but I was a teenager. I was a teenager. That's because we're disciples of, of Jesus. What I look at when I see this, this is, this is what I think. Fasting is for everyone. Fasting is for everyone. Fasting is voluntary. Jesus does not say you have to. It's, it's a voluntary. He doesn't say this is when you have to do it. And I know this sounds contradictory, but let me say it this way. From this, to me it seems, fasting and prayer, fasting is voluntary but not optional. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's voluntary, but it's not optional, according to the words of Jesus, according to the words of Jesus. So I want to encourage you. Now, instead of discouraging you, because some of you are looking at me this morning, and I can't tell if you're sleepy or if you're scared. <laughs> and you're thinking, what? And I want to encourage you because these words of Jesus are to you this morning. So if you've been thinking about fasting, but you've been scared to fast, or you're thinking it's going to be too hard for me, what I, want you to, what I want you to see is Jesus believes you can do it. And I'm not trying to make light. I'm really not. But there's a place for you in this. If you are a child of God, you don't have to be afraid about it. You can take part in this. And we're going to talk about some of the practical things about it in just a minute. So these are the words of Jesus. But let's go a little forward a little bit more into the New Testament church as well. Let's look at some times when the church prays. And I want to go really fast through this part because part, we're going to get to some other things. When is one of the first we, we saw in Acts chapter 1 um, when the church devoted itself to prayer. But let's look at one of the other times. We haven't gotten to it yet when they are threatened for healing the lame beggar and preaching about Jesus. This is the fourth part of our four-part sermon that we haven't gotten to yet. Remember when they heal? The, it's, it's, a, it's a story in four parts. Power, preaching, persecution, and prayer. This is the fourth part that we'll get to when we get back to Acts again. And they begin to pray. And what happens after they pray, the Bible says that the whole church is gathered together. The place that they are in was shaken. I have been, I shared this in the first service, one time in China when I was with a group of people and we were praying, we experienced this. 
I don't know if it was, I don't know how God did it. I don't know if the building shook or if it was just he gave us that sensation. But I remember we were praying together, and then the Chinese sister that was with me, she looked at me, she said, did you feel that? It was, we, had, we had just kind of finished praying. It was just kind of, and all of a sort of, <gasps> because the presence of the Lord was with us. And the Bible says that the, now does this mean that uh, your bedroom is going to shake when you go home and fast and pray? I don't know that. <laughs> This was a special circumstance. But you know what? Don't limit God. Don't limit God and don't look for all these things. Oh, God, you'll do this. Let God do what he will do. You do what, you, what God calls you to do and let him take care of what he's going to do. And then it says they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. They're, they're filled again with the Holy Spirit. Okay, what's another time? Let's look at the next one. When they appoint the first deacons. So that tells me something we've got. Is all of our deacon board here except for Pastor Al except Oh, that was, maybe that was a slip of the tongue. Sister Alma is not here this morning. But all the rest of the, our deacon board is here. You say, do we have a deacon board? Our board of, director, board of directors, they function as a deacon board. It was important. It was important enough that it wasn't just, let's look at your talents, let's look at your skills, let's look at what you're good at, and you can be a deacon. They laid hands on them and they prayed for them. It was important in the church. Okay, what else? What's another one that we see? Next one, when Peter and John were sent to Samaria to pray for Holy Spirit baptism for new believers. Let me say something to you this morning. So here's another time when the church prayed. If you have a hunger in your heart for the baptism with the Holy Spirit and you've been seeking God, you've prayed about it, or you maybe you've been thinking about it and you've not yet been given the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this time of fasting and prayer is a great time to pray ask God and to believe that God will do that and he will because in this in this story when we get to that later what's great about it we think sometimes we think we have to wait for a special time right it's got to be just right in this story Peter and John go they're preaching the gospel Peter has not even given an altar call you know for God to do something there has to be an altar call right I have to come forward. I have to raise a hand. I have to whatever. You know what's great about this one? They're preaching. Peter is preaching. He hasn't given an altar call. He hasn't even said, do you want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? He hasn't even said, do you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? He's preaching, and in the middle of it, all of these Gentiles start speaking in other tongues. God has his timing, and he doesn't, and he breaks into our expectation and our timing so often when our hearts are open to him and when we're praying. You don't have to wait for a special service. You get on your knees. You wait on the Lord in fasting and prayer and believe what he will do. Believe what he will do. By the way, do you remember that story I told you about being baptized in the Holy Spirit with, Ch with Cheryl? Remember... Um, a few weeks ago, that lady right back there in the red scarf, Denise, wave your hand. You heard me talk about it. Denise was the one. I told you about her. We were, I was laughing at her because she put her hands on, on Cheryl like that. But Denise was in that service. Not service. It was in our living room. It was in our living room. But when our hearts are open to him, when we're calling on him, God can do wonderful things. And then what else do we see? When Herod arrests Peter, intending to put him on trial, he's already arrested and <laughs> James, okay? And then he arrests Peter, and he's going to kill him the next day. And the church is praying, and I laugh when I read this because this reminds me of us sometimes. How many of you have ever been praying, 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 oh God, oh God, oh God, and your faith is so small, you don't really believe, you don't, even though you're praying, you don't really think God is going to answer this prayer. But you're praying, right? Because you should pray. Here's the great thing about this. The angel releases Peter from the prison, church is praying, and, but I don't know what their faith is, and they're praying, oh God, release Peter, save him. Peter comes to the door, knocks on the door, Rhoda, the serving girl, opens the door. She's so excited. This is why I love the story, and this is why I think it can't be made up. It's really real. She's so excited. Instead of letting Peter in, she closes the door in his face and goes running back, and she says, Peter's out. Peter's released. And they all say, you're seeing things. It must be a ghost. Their faith is so small. And that's the way we are sometimes, too. But nevertheless, God answered prayer. Amen. God answered prayer. So this was one of the times. And then let's look at some of the times of fasting and prayer. Let's look at some of them very, very quickly. 
probably Peter when God gives him the vision on the roof or when he has the trance because the word in the Greek is very special. It's only used one time in the Bible right there and it says that in the Greek it means Peter was extremely hungry. It's a very special word. Only used that time in the Bible. So he may, it's a lot of people believe he was fasting. We don't know if he, if, if exactly whether he was or not. But I want to encourage you right here because God is going to send Peter to the Gentiles. This is when he's going to go, uh, uh, this is when he's going to go to, oh, I think I got some stories mixed up, didn't I? I was talking about Cornelius. Sorry, I'm so excited. Let me back up. I don't want to preach false doctrine. Okay, rewind. Just a minute ago, they went to Samaria, half Gentile, half Jewish people. They prayed for them, laid hands on them, and then they were baptized. But the story that I just told you a minute ago was when they went to Cornelius's house, they were preaching, they were preaching, Peter was preaching, and while he was preaching, the Holy Spirit was given to them. And so this is just before Peter goes, and he's going to go to the Gentiles. Now, here's something I want to challenge you with and encourage you this morning. As you come into the time of fasting and prayer, some of you have a stirring in your heart or a desire in your heart that God is calling you to more than you are and more than you have and more than you are doing right now. But you've got to be ready for it. And you've got to hear him and you've got to be equipped. Fasting and prayer will get you to the place where you will hear God's call and where you will be ready to go beyond where you have gone before. A place, a person, a situation that you have not gone to or been in before, fasting and prayer prepares us to go where we have not gone before, to say what we have not said before, to speak to the one that we have been fearful to speak to before. Young people in your school, if you go tomorrow and tell all your classmates, I believe in Jesus and I'm this, most of them, except maybe your very best friends, will laugh at you. They will laugh at you. How are you going to share Jesus with them? You're going to have to be equipped and prepared, as Peter was. Some other examples very quickly. Next one. Saul for three days, no food or water. This was the same as Esther did. This is called the absolute fast. This is called an absolute fast, but it's a very special one when there's no food or water. Um, and, and if you are called to that type of fast, you have to know, know, know that God said fast in that way because it can be, if, and it's very short. The maximum is three days. Maximum is three days. But you have to know if that's what God's calling to. You have to say, God, I know that's you. One time in my life when I was in Beijing, God called me to that. And before I did it, I asked God, I said, God, is this you? I have to know because it was, this is, this is you have to really know. And God made it very clear, and so I did, and I was able to. But, but this, is the, this is one that you have to know. You've heard the, the voice of God. And then what else do we see? In Antioch, when Paul and Barnabas go out on the first great missionary journey, they were fasting and praying before the Lord. And then finally, when they were setting up elders in the church. So here, this was, these were times of fasting and prayer. And so we see it in the Old Testament. We see it in Jesus, and we see it in the New Testament. Now, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Let me give you, very quickly, some practical guides. And let's look at the next one. I know I'm going through. Uh, by the way, the book of Acts records about 40 times, 40 mentions of fasting and prayer. Can you imagine that? 40 times of prayer or prayer at, with fasting. Most, more prayer than prayer and fasting. Almost 40 times. So if, what are we going to do about it? Here's some practical helps. Number one, set your objectives. Know what you're aiming for. Know where you're going. What are, what are you looking for as you go into this time of fasting? This is number one. Because if you, you need a goal or else just, okay, well, I guess, okay, I'm not going to eat for two or three days. If, if, 
if that's what we do, then that's no, not much better than dieting. It really is. And it, it accomplishes very little. So set some objectives. Secondly, decide what type of fast you will do. Believe me, if you get up tomorrow morning and say, hmm, how shall I fast today? You will fail. You will fail. Because if we depend on our feelings, what we feel like doing or what we don't feel like doing, our bodies will never want to fast. Did you know that your body will never really want to do what God wants it to do? It won't. That's why we fast. That's why we fast, to tell our bodies and to tell our stomachs, hey, guess what? You are not the boss of me, as we say sometimes. You're not the boss of me. So set your what type of fast are you going to do? And we'll talk about that just very, very quickly. By the way, I'm going to go over about four or five minutes this morning, okay? Prepare yourself. Don't start getting impatient right now. Just say, ah, breathe a little bit, and then in about five minutes we'll close. And then finally, expect results. <laughs> expect results. So here are some practical things for you. We're going to look at these very quickly. Set your objectives, decide your fast, and then expect results. So first of all, Set your objectives. What are some things that you can do in setting objectives? I'm not telling you what objectives to set. I'm giving you some things that for me are meaningful, okay? What's the first one? For me, I want to declare a dependence on God. I am just as I tithe from the money that I have and I'm saying to God, God, it's all yours and you are my source and I depend on you. I'm tithing time at the beginning of this year by saying, God, all my time is yours too. My time this year, it's your time. All these days, they're yours. You've given them to me, they're in your hands. And so I'm declaring my dependence on God. Fasting is a wonderful way for doing that. Secondly, for me, it's going to be a time of, if you want to call it that way, house cleaning. In my heart, you say, Pastor Jennifer, you need to house clean in your heart. I sure do, and so do you. We all do, we all do. A, a good example, those of you that live in Chinese households or you are a Chinese household, are you going to go into Chinese New Year with dirty, broken things in your house and messy here and there? No! Chinese New Year comes and I look on the sides of the roads and there's all this furniture out there and I look at it and I think, that's good furniture. By the way, that's how Brother Philip filled his first apartment in Hong Kong. At, he did. At Chinese New Year, he just went, and, oh, this is good, this is good. And I look at things and I think, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe one scratch or this or that. But it's, it's, it's messed up. It's messed up. Brothers and sisters, just as we do house cleaning and clean up our, our, our things, there's a time and a place for, for spiritual heart house cleaning as well, isn't there? And fasting and prayer helps to do that. Then what's another for me, another objective, to refocus on the eternal, to refocus on the eternal. What does that mean? What does that mean? My life and your life, all of us, it can be full of things that are not eternal. And a lot of times it comes in the form of, ooh, look at this game. Text, Facebook, ding, 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 this, that. Oh, selfie, this and that. <laughs> I don't do selfies, <laughs> not very much. I do them and then I delete them because I look so bad. <laughs> now you know the real reason I don't do selfies. I'm not that humble, I just look bad in selfies. It's because I'm so proud that I don't do selfies. But our, our, our hearts and our lives get so full of the world. They really, our hearts and our lives get full of the concerns of, of now, right? And fasting, here it is, fasting disconnects us from the world. Prayer connects us to God. Prayer connects us to God. And that's what, so for me, that's going to be one of my objectives. I, when I come in a lot of times and I'm tired, I love to sit down. I don't want to watch something dirty or ugly or bad on TV, but I sit down and turn on the TV and that's when I relax. I sit down and, and whatever. And that's what I do fairly often. But when I do that, then I don't have time for some other things that are eternal things, right? And so for me, that's going to be one of the objectives. What is, what's another one of the objectives? I want to invite the presence of the Lord into my life. Because I'm going to kick out some other things during this time, I'm going to make some space for God. Facebook's not going to be part of I don't do a lot of Facebook anyhow. I usually do it for business. But other things as well, all this and that or whatever. And so we focus not on no eating, 
but we keep our focus on the right thing. It's not, okay, I'm not going to eat. It is, I'm going to set these things aside so that I can feast on the Lord and I've got time for him. Next, prepare for new or greater ministry or responsibility. That's one thing I'm going to do this year. I don't know what your objective is, but may I say this? If you have a position of service or ministry or responsibility in Lighthouse at any level, at any level, please listen. I speak to you on behalf of Pastor Renee as your pastors. We urge you, we expect that you should be fasting and praying about your service and your ministry in the church. And for everybody else, there's a place for us as well. What does God want us to do? What's next? Ask and believe for specific answers. Believe it. When you spend time with God, when you disconnect from the world and you connect with God through prayer, your faith is going to grow. And when your faith grows, you're going to ask God for the right things, and God is going to answer. Do I have another one there or the next? Decide what type of fast. If you say, I don't know, look online. There are all sorts of options. There are all sorts of options. One of them is the absolute fast, but that one, you've really got to know that God said it to you, and it's for a short time. It might, and God may say to you, I'd like you to absolute fast for a day, maybe, as part of this, um, but that's between you and God. Secondly, the complete fast, that's a water-only fast, and that's what Jesus did, and that's what the New Testament church did. So you might say, oh, well, that's what I'll do. I, we're not saying that. Holy Spirit can tell you what to do. But it might be a complete, complete fast, or it might be, next one, a partial fast, which was the Daniel fast, juice or liquid, or fasting a meal, or two or three meals, or fasting part of the time, or restricting your diet. Those of you that have uh, physical concerns, that's where you can fast. You can restrict certain parts of your diet. Young people, we encourage you not to. You have to talk with your parents, but your bodies are still developing. So if you say, I want to fast and pray, then definitely absolute fast. Mm, you don't have to ask God. Don't do it, okay? Um, complete fast, probably not if you're a younger person. But there are things you can do here um, that, you can, that you can fast, including fasting, texting, and things like that as well. You can have a part here. Um, so this is an area, or you can do a combination of any of these. So these are some options for you. Um, but then a couple other things to keep in mind. It depends on your personal circumstances and convictions. Don't let anybody else say to you, oh, Malou, this is how you should be fasting. It's that Malou right there. That's between you. You ask God. God will tell you how to fast. May I say something else? Don't look at somebody else who goes out and eat lunch today and you say, you're not fasting lunch, okay? <laughs> now that is legalism. That's legalism. And Jesus doesn't have any part. So you may see, you may see Pastor Renee eat lunch today. Pastor Renee, are you going to eat lunch today? He's not. Oh, I can't eat lunch either then. <laughs> no. We laugh about this, but what we're saying is this. You get with God. God will, will show you and tell you what you need to do. And then, next, don't choose the easiest or the hardest. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. And I include that because some of you are so hard on yourselves. Oh, I've got to choose the very hardest fast, and this is what my, I must do. But not if God, that's not how God is. And some of us will choose the easiest one. I'm, I'm scared, and I don't think I can do it. I'll, okay, I won't, I won't. I won't eat meat at lunchtime. That'll be it, okay? <laughs> if that's what God tells you, then that's what you can do. But we're laughing about that, but I really mean it. Let the Holy Spirit lead you, and he will, into the best type of fast for you. Amen? Amen. 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 Finally, and here we close. Isaiah 58. Stay with me. One and a half more minutes. Isaiah 58. The whole chapter is about fasting the right type of fast and the wrong type of fast. Expect results when you fast in the right way. You say, Pastor Jennifer, what's the right way? What if I do it the wrong way? Just come to God and say, God, I want to fast in the right way. Check my heart, check my motives, and he'll help you fast in the right way. This is what it says in Isaiah 58, verses 8 and 9. Click. 
Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, here am I. So here are your three words. You ready for your three words? You don't even need a pencil for this. You can remember it. Look at the next one. Then, this is after you, this is after you've, after you've fasted, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Some of you are going to be healed in your body physically. Amen. Some of you are going to receive healing in your family, in restoration of relationships. Some of you need to be healed in emotions or in other areas. When we fast and wait on the Lord, his promise to us is that his healing will come into our lives. There's your first word, healing. Expect results. Second one, your righteousness will go then, after your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard what does righteousness mean? I've kept all the words simple so that you can understand. It has to do with holiness. So healing is the first one. Holiness is the second one. Through fasting and prayer, God is going to work in you. He's going to make himself like you. He's going to pour his holiness into you. He's going to change you. You're going to be more like Jesus. Healing, holiness. And the final word is, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. And the final thing you may expect is that his help will come where you need it, when you need it. When we fast and pray, expect results from the Lord. Healing, do you need healing? Wait on the Lord. Do you need his holiness? Oh, how I need that. Wait on the Lord. Do you need help? Wait on the Lord. This is his promise. Lord, May your word be applied to our hearts and to our lives. May we not walk out of these doors and ignore it and say, this is not for me. But Lord, may we respond to you and to you only. Lord, we reject and cast off any condemnation or any guilt or any, any legalism, but we want your Holy Spirit to lead us so that as we fast and as we pray, Lord, we will please your heart and we will draw near to you and you will do great things. And your healing and your holiness and your help will be poured out and made evident in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray.